Welcome, my name is Hazard, and today we're gonna to go for a flight in the F-16. This isn't just any flight though, we're gonna go for an experimental test flight, testing a new physiological monitoring device, courtesy of the Defense Innovation Unit, along with the 422 Test and Evaluation Squad. Today, you're gonna to get a front row seat to footage that's never been seen before. So here's the problem that we're trying to solve. Modern fighters have dozens of sensors on board. However, there's nothing that monitors the pilot, which is the most important part of the weapon system. Solutions to this, as well as many other problems, can often be solved by using commercial technology that's already been developed. That's why I've teamed up with the Defense Innovation Unit. Think of DIU as the glue between commercial companies and the military. Before the military goes through a lengthy process to build new technology on their own, they first look to tweak it and buy it from commercial companies. It's been a difficult path to make this happen, but it's incredibly important for the future of our military that we speed up innovation. So let's see how they're changing the landscape for the warfighter. To help explain it, I have Flip Warden, who's a former aggressor and now an operational test pilot, as well as Stoike Goldberg, who's an F-16 pilot, currently working for DIU to help accelerate change within the military. Yeah, so what the 422 does here is, is really cool, actually. So um, I don't know if it's been briefed before, but we're the operational uh, test um, and evaluation squadron for the United States Air Force. So we see a lot of unique pieces of technology uh, that the Air Force and the major combat Air Force doesn't normally get. One of those technologies is the spider ear cups that you see here. The key technology here is a pulse oximeter that you see in this light uh, right here that warns me, uh, the pilot, uh, of whether or not I have impending hypoxia symptoms. So what's really cool about that hazard is uh, that for once with these key, you know, low cost innovations, I as the most lethal aspect of this airframe uh, can maximize my own lethality and survivability by knowing when I might be in a life threatening situation. So what does it sound like when uh, you're encountering that? Yeah, so I, I, luckily I've not heard it much, which means maybe I'm uh, doing well airborne, uh, but uh, when I have a low uh, pulse oximeter or a uh, oxygen count in my blood, it'll give me kind of a single rate or a double rate type beeping sound to warn me that I actually uh, have a, a problem. Just like the old T-38. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right, Stoiky. Here we go, here's the gear. Why don't you tell me a little bit about it? Yep, this is from Honeywell, and there's both a bra and an undershirt, uh, so pilots can detect right, both your heart rate, so if you have any physiological incidences with your cardiovascular system, uh, as well as being able to understand your constriction during G-strain maneuvers, actually if you're performing them correctly. And then what do we have right here? This is a product that is a forehead sensor from a company called Nearsense. And it is able to be able to detect pulse ox directly from your forehead, which is a lot more accurate than any other part of your body. So all these things are doing kind of the same thing, they're just different ways of solving it. Absolutely, leveraging commercial technology to take a couple shots on goal to be able to determine what is the fastest, cheapest, and best way to be able to provide pilots real time feedback while they're in, in flight. So we've outfitted Flip with the gear and now he's gonna test it during an actual sortie. We've also installed several cameras inside the cockpit. The flight today is BFM, also known as dogfighting, which is one of the most physically demanding missions on a fighter pilot's body. For the first half of the flight, Flip will simulate that he's behind an enemy aircraft and has to kill it with the gun. The second half they'll swap and his wingman Ike will be the offender and will try to gun Flip. Throughout the flight, we'll show his heart rate, which averages 50 at rest, as well as his blood oxygen level, which is in the high 90s. Anything less than 90 can result in hypoxia and ultimately incapacitation. This is my office. Welcome to my office. Uh, when does the fatigue factor start setting in for dogfighting or for BFM? This, uh Contrary to popular belief, is a sport uh, in the in all the sense of the physicality of the word. And you're going to see once we start doing BFM here in just a minute that my heart rate's going to increase, uh, my bodily response and my temporal distortion is going to increase, uh, and you're going to see uh, how uh, much more difficult it becomes for me to think and to talk and to communicate uh, through a high G, high stress scenario like dogfighting. All right, maneuver now to 2.0 nautical miles. It's going to be our first higher G sortie, uh, higher G moment. We've got a uh, 7G limit right now, uh, so we'll look to hold that uh, with the tanks that we have on. All right, so we're going to call down ranges until 1.5, which is going to be our fights on. 2 1.9, 1.8, 1.7, 1.6, 1.5, fights on. Fox 3. Looking for the turn circle entry. Right about there. It's going downhill. Uh, 
Altitude. Altitude. Nice. Just above the floor. Maintain airspeed. All right. We're lower on G's now. Now we just need to raid around the circle and catch him. Let's see what he does. Okay, 1.0. 0.9. Hundred and ten knots of closure. Looks good. Oh, he's right above the floor. Viper terminate, Viper one terminate. Viper two terminate. Next at defensive 6K for number one. All right, so you can see how my heart rate is slightly increased here. Uh, the G was high initially, but these next ones, once uh, we're, are, we are at an unlimited G restriction, uh, should be good to go for us uh, to see that higher heart rate. We've got about 400 pounds to go. All right, so this one's gonna be a defensive uh, posture in a uh, longer range set. So this one's a 6K. He's gonna start at 1.5 nautical miles. Uh, and then I'm gonna be the defender with a pipe floor of 10,000 feet. So really the name of the game here is to stay out of his threat uh, uh, threat weapons engagement zone. So that's going to be both his gun and his missiles. Uh, so primarily what you're going to see today is trying to dodge his, uh, his gun if he gets in close. Fight to survive is really the name of the game in defensive BFM. And you're going to keep doing that until he, the uh, adversary either hits the ground, runs out of gas, or your wingman saves you. So there we go. Let's see how this one works out. One's ready. Check right. Yes, where is he? Valley. It's third circle entry on time. He's in lag. Okay. Altitude. Altitude. Oh, against one of the most experienced guys in operational test. Some of these guys are so experienced that, uh, you know, they just never miss. Unfortunately, I'm on the receiving end of that, so. All right, let's see if we can survive this time. One's ready. Pick left. First to go high wins. Nice, he's got a good climb going on. Let's see if we can win it. There's the horn. Get from still 19 cap. Check left. Point two. 
Go. Titan turn, deep six. Tally. Altitude. No lead. He's in lag. Now. AB, can I save it? Maybe not in a two bag. Well, we saved it. Oh. Go five for 10,000. Five for knock it off, five for one, knock it off. Five for two, knock it off. All right, Max, 6.9 G's there. That's a good one. Left-hand turn. Whew, okay, so you can really see now uh, the effects of G's on the body. You're, you're turning around, you're fighting, and especially in defensive BFM, you have no opportunity to relax. So yeah, I'm curious to see what my heart rate looks like and what the G's look like on that set. Tower Viper 3 2 ship is 5 to the north of Craig for initial. Bingo. Viper 3 Nellis, Tower left, break runway 3 left. Viper 3 left to left. All right, so today we, we did a basic uh, fighter maneuvers sortie, right? So that we can assess uh, the usefulness of the spider ear cups uh, in uh, kind of a dynamic scenario. Um, the cool thing about that is uh, we were able to get out there, get into kind of a, a knife fight in a phone booth sort of situation and see my heart rate increase, uh, see what happens to my body under G's, and then really uh, see the data that comes out of that from the spider gear. That's so. cool, so we can check it all out here afterwards. That's right. Yep. All right, so let's take a look. All right, so uh, looking at here, a little bit of familiarization. What you see, this is the uh, spider equipment specifically. What you see here on the top, uh, this is all for the sortie that we had today. So on the left-hand side in blue, you see the oxygen percent inside uh, uh, my nugget, essentially going through these center sensors into my brain. From there, you go down to this section. This is really what we're looking at today. In orange, you see the pulse. Uh, so that's my beats per minute uh, from my heart measured through these sensors uh, here as well. And then in purple are the Gs that I've pulled throughout the sortie. So what you can see here is elapsed time in minutes. So me taking off is kind of about this point here at which we uh, proceed on a navigational portion of the mission out to our tactical fight airspace. From there, uh, you see the Gs start to increase initially uh, uh, in kind of, of a repetitive motion at an interval of about five minutes or so. That's each of the sets, each of the fights that uh, we did today, all right? What's really interesting to see here is that uh, as I pull G's, um, my heart rate slowly increases. Uh, another thing worth mentioning here as well is um, what this system can do for us in uh, telling me as a pilot in a debrief sort of sense how I was doing on G's for the day. So something interesting to note here is that um, how the, these G's and pulse relate to my oxygen uh, in my brain. So as I'm pulling G's here, you see those peaks at the bottom of the map here. You can see how at the exact moment where those G's peak, that my uh, oxygen, my brain actually decreases from about 100 to 90. Um, so this is a way for us to look at and see, hey, was my G strain good enough today? And this is kind of an indicator, especially in this second set here, that maybe my G strain wasn't good enough. Um, as I'm allowing uh, blood to flow out of my brain, uh, which could be a risk to a pilot. This is incredible data. I've never seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that our heart rates are like 120 just when you're, you know, taking off, right? not right. doing anything extreme. I would say uh, my heart rate is a little bit higher than normal today. All right, so where, where do you see this technology going in the future? 
Yeah, I think uh, you know this type of low cost, high technology uh, innovation is an incredible step forward for us uh, as warfighters in the DoD. Um, what I see from this specifically as a physiological monitoring device is that it's it's allowing me as the most critical aspect of the warfighting machine that I fly, uh, it's allowing me to um, maximize both my lethality and my survivability because at the end of the day, if me as the critical piece of this machine is incapacitated or not functioning, then no weapons are gonna go down range and the mission's not gonna get done. Awesome. Well, Flip, thanks for letting us see what you guys do here. Likewise. It's good to have you, Hazard, for sure. Now, it's important to understand that what we tested today is just a fraction of what DIU is working on. I had a chance to talk with Stoiki about how DIU is having effects on the battle space right now and how you might be able to help. All right, Stoiki, what is the problem that DIU is trying to solve? At the end of the day, it's about moving our nation faster. What does DIU do to speed that up? So at the end of the day, we're trying to lower the barriers to entry to make it easier for, for companies to actually work with us. We've radicalized the contracting process so that all that is required is a 15-page slide deck. We move very quickly. Commercial terms, commercial pricing. We get companies on contract in 60 to 90 days. And our focus is to get those technologies into our warfighters' hands. In months, not in years. Is there an example that you can share where you nurtured a technology to the warfighter? Absolutely. In any one of our categories, you could take artificial intelligence. We were able to take aircraft data for predictive maintenance, where we can actually detect when parts are going to break before they do. You, look, you can look at what is happening in Ukraine, where we're taking commercial satellite imagery, synthetic at the aperture radar, at commercial pricing, being able to get real-time data on where Russian troops are to be able to help our allied partners. You're able to take things like 3D printed buildings, right, or 3D printed parts for our aircraft to help with global security challenges that we have with our supply chains. And now we're working on physiological status monitoring right here with our F-16s. And the whole point of this particular episode is to talk about saving lives, right? Us as pilots, we know that we've had people that we've lost and we've had incidences ourselves where we're not able to understand why we're not feeling good that day. Maybe it's a hypoxic situation. Maybe we gray lock or G lock or we're having issues with our vision based upon the G forces of the aircraft. Now in real time, we have actual monitoring to be able to provide us real time of what is, uh, what is happening with our bodies to increase our human performance. I want to thank the 422 Test and Evaluation Squadron, as well as the Defense Innovation Unit. Commercial technology is incredibly important for us to be able to win the next fight. If you have a solution, email info at diu.mil. I'll see you next time.